there's a section at the back of the Norton called Critical Approaches. And um, critical approaches are part of a larger area of study called uh, theory, critical theory. And these are basically different ways of interrogating a text. So when we approach a literary text for the first time, there are all kinds of questions we can ask of it. And uh, in large part, the questions that we decide to ask of a particular text are informed by a critical approach that we have. In some rare cases, the critical approach grows out of the text itself, so that if you have, for example, a Dickens novel that is based on a class system in um, 19th century England, it might make sense to use a Marxist approach to that text to understand the relationship between the bourgeois um, capitalists who are making money and exploiting the poor and the proletariat, and Dickens kind of explores that. So in some particular cases, certain texts lend, them, lend themselves readily to uh, a, a critical approach uh, to a text. But in many cases, uh, critics approach a text with a preconceived worldview of what literature is and why we should study literature and, by implication, what the value of a text is. So one of the things that I like about the way the Norton lays this out um, is that they divide it into three different areas. Um, the text says the first area is the text or the source, um, which is highlighted, the author and other factors that produce the text. The second area is the reader or how the text is received. We call that reception. And um, the third area um, is the context uh, in which it all happens. So um, with that in mind, I'm inviting you to to read through some of these approaches at the back of the text. Um, in an introductory course, I can't do very much other than acquaint you with the, the lay of the land and hope that you will look and familiarize yourself with at least two or three of these different approaches and find something that interests you that you might pursue later on. However, I want to begin my discussion by making one large point here. And um, this has to do with um, Roland Barthes, who um, in uh, the late 60s um, formulated uh, an, a notion that he called the death of the author. The author is dead. And if you walk away with anything from this course, what I want you to have is this concept. So what this premise suggests is that it makes no sense to say Shakespeare intended us to feel sorry for Othello, or Shakespeare intended this to be ironic, because authorial intention is very, very difficult to prove. I know it sounds like semantics, but I want you to avoid using the author's surname as the subject of a sentence in which you are attributing intention to the phenomenon in a literary text. Shakespeare intended that, or Shakespeare planned that. Rather, I want you to say the text invites us to come to this conclusion. The text invites us to think this way, feel something, that sort of notion. And if you keep that in mind, you will avoid this notion of the fallacy of authorial intention. Now, I want to go through a few of these examples um, from, um, from the Norton. The first has to do with new criticism, which it says here minimizes the consideration of the source, which is the text and the receiver, um, instead um, assumes that the, the literary work is a unified, coherent whole. Now, this is a very important concept. So um, this new critical approach basically uh, begins by saying the text is a unified entity. All of the meaning that you need to glean from the text is contained in the text itself. You don't have to go outside into what we would call context. Everything is there. All you need is the poem or the play in front of you, and if you study that material enough, you will be able to comprehend it. One step 
beyond that is structuralism. And um, it's there's a couple of good quotes here I just want to, um, to read to you. Um, the Norton says that um, a, structural, a structuralist critic of literature or culture would study what they call shared systems of meaning, such as genre or myth. Now, I've already talked about genre as a set of inherited expectations about a particular kind of literature. And so what a structuralist does is to look at a poem and to connect it to not only the genre of poems, but the subgenre of different kinds of poems, lyrics or um, epithalamians or elegies or uh, epics or whatever the particular kind is. And so um, you, as a structuralist, would look for your particular text's relationship to other texts that preceded it. And um, that, it says here at the bottom, structuralism shows little interest in the creative process or the authors or their intentions or their circumstances. Similarly, structuralism discounts the idiosyncrasies of particular readings. We're not looking for anything unique or idiosyncratic in an interpretation. It takes text to represent interactions of words and ideas that stand apart from individual human identities. And so a structuralist approach is going to contextualize our particular poem, play, story in the genre or the recurring mythologies that occur in a culture. And I'll talk about those in a minute when I talk about um, Carl Jung. You'll see another category here, one worth um, a quick look, which is deconstruction. I've talked about this elsewhere in my lectures. Um, it says here that for deconstruction, the tr traditional concept of the author as a creative origin of the text comes under fire in deconstructualist criticism. So um, this is what Barth is talking about here, the death of the author. We're not really um, interested in what Shakespeare's intentions were. Um, but what deconstruction does is basically start from the premise that every text inherently and sometimes unconsciously argues against itself. Now, I want you to pay attention to how I've expressed that because I've personified the text. That is to say, I've attributed human attributes to the text itself. So while a text might be busy making an argument against the idea of war or against the idea of human suffering, there will be other moments in the text where those ostensibly explicit intentions are challenged or undermined or disrupted or somehow disturbed. And so deconstruction basically looks for moments of unconscious self-contradiction and embarrassment in a text when the main flow of the argument seems to be disrupted by other alternative subversive voices. Um, biographical criticism um, defies all of that and says, no, 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 you have to understand the biography of an author in order to help interpret any literary text that they've written. Freudian criticism begins from within Freudian theory, ego, super ego, um, the id, and looks for ways in which literary texts engage or express or invoke a Freudian understanding of the world. Now, it is possible to combine some of these approaches so that um, you might use deconstructionism with a Freudian reading to come up with your own reading of a text. Jung, um, J-U-N-G, Carl Jung, is, uh, to my mind, one of the more interesting psychological approaches to literature. Jung formulates the notion of an archetype, which is a recurring pattern or figure that appears in various literatures across time and space. And these archetypal recurring patterns, says Jung, get gathered up and manifested in each new literary text that is produced. And so 
again, I come back to the notion of genre, the tension between conforming to the expectations of the genre and deconstructing or undermining or challenging or innovating against those very predictable um, expectations that we have. So um, there are lots of archetypes. Uh, one of them, for example, in Jung is a shadow, which is the um, Jungian equivalent, I suppose, of the Freudian id. It's part of the unconscious mind that um, that is our dark side, our potential for evil. Something that you might want to pay attention to, and this is going to come up a little bit in um, in gender studies too. I'm just going to type these words up here for you so you can see what I'm talking about. Um, Jung also talks about something called the animus and the anima. And it's just a theory, but he basically argues that human nature, by definition, uh, the human being is essentially both masculine and feminine at the same time, that we are two genders at once, but that in the socialization process, in the case of um, women, um, their masculine side, the animus, is um, repressed. And in the case of men, their feminine side, the anima, is repressed. And to be repressed means to be denied or ignored or pushed to the peripheral edges of our consciousness. There are some interesting things that Jung suggests about what happens when we encounter that which we have repressed. Um, for example, in the case of men, um, one of the things that Jung suggests is when we encounter a partner whose feminine attributes map to the feminine attributes that we have repressed, so if I meet somebody who, who embodies everything that I've repressed about my feminine self, I am either attracted to that person uh, because they mirror what I cannot deal with, or I am invited, prompted, um, I feel the impulse to want to annihilate or to kill them because that's what I, I'm, I've, I've looked at, that which I have denied. There's all kinds of other things in Jung that are so interesting, um, something called the trickster figure. This is a recurring figure in literature who pulls a prank and causes mischief. It's not to be confused with a villain who um, is evil and brings disaster to people, but more has to do with um, a figure that brings about change in a text, a literary text, by disguising him or herself or um, fooling people into thinking things that are true when they're actually not. Um, Jung talks about a quest motif, which is a journey um, from civilization into the wilderness, the hero is challenged or tried and then returns back to civilization, a changed person. Think about Lord of the Rings um, as an example of a quest uh, motif. Um, Spencer's Fairy Queen is one. There are all kinds of stories out there that follow Jungian archetypes. And so if you're a Jungian, you are going to approach a literary text and to look for, um, for issues uh, in the text that basically reflect your Jungian approach to the world. Um, when I was talking about Freud, just to return to him for a moment, um, in in the novel Dracula, um, Dracula uh, leaves uh, Transylvania and moves to England, and he begins to prey upon two women in particular, Lucy and Mina. And the men in that novel um, are... Um, driven to protect their females and um, they have to basically try to kill Dracula because he is transforming their women into entities that are aggressive and that uh, that they don't like. And what's interesting about this is that Freud postulates something called primal horde theory and what he argues in primal horde theory is that um, human beings act like dogs, essentially, like animals. There's alpha males who uh, control the whole pack, 
and in the animal world the alpha male has access sexual access to all of the females and the rest of the males the beta and below um, live in fear of the alpha male because the alpha male uh, can physically beat them up and punish them and so when you look at what's happening in Dracula it does fit beautifully with Freud's notion of primal horde um, Dracula is the alpha male he is the um, the alpha who has access to Lucy's and Mina's sexuality when the rest of the men in the pack do not and in order to restore balance and equilibrium they have to kill this alpha male or as Freud would say they have to kill the father figure so when you start to understand um, a little bit of psychology and you can see it manifested in the text it becomes a way for you to frame your understanding of the text um, the other category emphasis on the receiver you'll see something here called reader response criticism what this is is a more internalized monitoring of your own reactions as you read a text you kind of monitor what you're feeling and how you are reacting and that becomes your way into a discussion on the text it's pretty well fallen out of favor now but certainly um, one of the things about reader response criticism is that you could take a look for example at a history of stage productions of Hamlet and look at how different audiences over time reacted to um, a certain moment in the play or reacted to a particular character in the play and compare the reaction the historical reaction of audiences from the past to your own personal reaction here in the 21st century or to a modern uh, production of the play um, so that's reader response Marxist criticism interrogates text with the idea that um, you are looking for ways in which the text either supports capitalist activity or attacks capitalist activity you can combine as I say Marxism with deconstruction so if you have a text that basically is busy um, attacking like Dickens is busily attacking um, the horrific consequences of um, industrial capitalism and condemning it you would also look for moments in the in that story where capitalism is actually praised or where the possibly the good aspects of um, of capitalism are revealed um, sometimes not intentionally by the text by which I mean the text never says that but it implies that as a subtext so that's how you would combine those um, gender studies and queer theory have um, had a long and um, storied struggle with um, mainstream literature and criticism to be heard um, there is now a body of literature that is explicitly focused on issues of gender and queerness and how human beings struggle with the expression um, of, of those uh, desires and those orientations but um, it's also possible for someone who is approaching a literary text from this way to read a text that does not officially or um, explicitly engage gender or queer issues um, but ends up talking about them unconsciously or accidentally it's still possible in other words for somebody who comes from gender studies or queer theory to read a text that is not really about gender studies or queer theory and to show how that text makes assumptions about who these people are or how that text makes assumptions about what kind of human beings these people are and so on so just because you're oriented that way doesn't mean you only want to read literature that suits your particular approach similarly as I was talking about Marxist criticism Marxist critics are going not only going to read Dickens but they're going to read other texts as well it's just that some literary texts lend themselves more readily to certain approaches um, rather than others but any approach can be applied to any text the Norton also talks about African-American and ethnic literary studies um, 
These are very interesting studies. It says here, criticism in histories of African-American literature tended to ignore and dismiss women writers, while feminist literary histories uh, neglected women writers of color. So a lot of African-American and ethnic, century, uh, ethnic uh, literary studies combine feminist studies uh, together to argue that women of color or women of ethnic difference are um, uh, disadvantaged doubly, not only because of skin color or race, but also because of um, of the fact that they are female. And so um, you can st you begin to approach a text with these kinds of questions. What does the text assume about this world? What does the text want us, invite us to think or feel about this world um, that is being created in the story? Um, Post-colonial also a huge area um, of literary expertise and criticism um, comes out of India, the Caribbean, um, Australia, Canada, any country or national literature that was subject to um, British rule. And, um, and those uh, literary texts are often involving and exploring the psychological space, the consequences of colonialism on human lives. And so um, they begin to ask questions about the power relationship between the center and the margins of the empire. They begin to ask questions about dominance and control and traditional structures of power. So you can go through these different approaches and have a look at them. And um, I invite you to ask questions about them um, in class uh, in whatever form is appropriate. And um, let's continue the conversation on all of this.